Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for a panel discussion hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAST for short. My name is Ariel Liji, and I'm CCAST's Grassland Community of Practice Coordinator. Uh, I'm coming you, to you today from Tucson, Arizona, which is home to the Tohono O'odham and Pascoyaxi Nations. And although I sit in southeastern Arizona, CCAST's Grassland Community of Practice touches on issues such as the use of fire that we'll be discussing today um, that span across broad geographies. So welcome from wherever you're coming. Um, CCAST supports issue-based instead of geography-based conservation. And the way that we do that is by facilitating uh, opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange, such as writing case studies, hosting webinars, and hosting workshops. These activities support the development of communities of practice focused on grassland restoration, non-native aquatic species management, and drought and climate adaptation. Today, we're going to be hearing from three speakers who are going to be sharing their insights and lessons learned about using fire as a tool for restoration and management of grasslands. We're going to follow up these three presentations with a panel discussion where we'll really invite everybody to, to jump in, turn on your videos, and ask questions um, to each other and the panelists. In the meantime, we encourage you to make use of the chat. If you're not familiar with Zoom, you can find that usually on the bottom of your screen, a little chat box. Open that up and just feel free to put any questions you have in there for panelists, for each other, answer folks' questions. Um, yeah, one of the great things about doing this in an online format is we can really take advantage of the chat and allow for these parallel discussions to be happening. Today's presentation, as you can see, will be recorded and we're going to post that on CCAST's YouTube page. Um, and we'll make sure that everybody knows where to find that as soon as it's up. We'll send a follow up email. So today we have three speakers. Uh, we're going to be starting with Steve Sesney, uh, who will be discussing um, his work using fire at Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuge. Steve will be um, followed by Scott Collins, who will be discussing the use of fire at Sevilleta, and then we'll close out the presentations by hearing from Jeff Adams, who will be giving us a more regional perspective about fire planning in the Southwest. So thank you once again, everybody, for joining us. And without further ado, uh, Steve, if you wanted to kick it off, I'll let you share your screen, and, and we'll get going with those presentations. OK, just working on my screen here. Hopefully, you can all see that. I'll start the talk here. Looks great. Awesome. I'm going to grab my pointer, too, because I have some maps. Um, so today, I'm going to really be kind of laser focused on mass bobwhite quail. It's an endangered species um, located in southern Arizona. I have some maps to show, but really um, prescribed fire and field treatment effects on habitat, um, restoring habitat for this quail species. And if you know a little bit about quail, um, the female looks a lot like uh, northern bobwhite quail, which is its co closest cousin over in Texas. But the male has this sort of very distinct bright red chest. It is the most Western species of bobwhite quail, I believe, in both the United States and Mexico. And it inhabits semi-desert grasslands, which we're going to drill into in just a minute. Um, most of the work that I'm talking about today was a collaboration between the US Fish and Wildlife Service. I worked for the Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm a spatial ecologist with a background in forestry. Um, in the last decade, a lot more uh, grassland and desert ecology and uh, collaborating with my colleagues at Northern Arizona University. Emily Yurkich was a graduate student. Another Fish and Wildlife Service person here, Lakrisha Johnson, he's, she's a recovery team leader for this endangered species. And Tom Sisk, a professor of landscape ecology and conservation biology at NAU. Um, a little bit of background about mass bobwhite. Um, what's really um, important to know is that mass bobwhite is, was or is considered Arizona's rarest bird and it was it disappeared from its range which I will show in a minute um, really at the turn of the century and the cause of that um, as many of you may know Sonoran grasslands um, were fairly altered 
um, at the turn of the century by some very intensive drought effects, um, very intensive grazing practices. So land use, very important factor. And then later on, um, some vegetation changes, and I, I haven't named all of them here, uh, non-native grasses, and of course, um, an increase in woody plants. A lot of the literature talks about um, these extensive changes within the grasslands. And so for today's focus, um, I will talk about Buenos Aires, where for at least the last several decades, we've been attempting to reintroduce the mass bobwhite quail to its former historical range, really since the 1970s forward. At the same time, we were removing grazing from uh, this refuge, um, Buenos Aires in southern Arizona, while we were restoring a, a frequent fire regime. And that work continues. So just a little bit of extra context. When I came to the Fish and Wildlife Service in 2011, there were no mass bobwhite quail except a captive breeding population on the refuge. Um, they had stopped the release program. Uh, there were many um, uh, issues with success rates and restoring uh, the captive breeding population. So this, this study took place without any birds out there. Um, because of some changes to the program, there is now a, a semi-established population, so some new opportunities to study birds that are actually in the wild. But at the time of the study or this work, um, there were no birds um, on the ground out there. So just, just to get us located, um, there's a couple of study areas, but really I'm focused here um, in southern Arizona, right on the border, close to Tucson that's up, up here. Um, this gray shaded area um, is a hillshade map from elevation, but this is the historical range, the known range or distribution of massed bobwhite. And these reddish areas, one of the first things I did was collect all the historical data and make a um, species distribution map with some covariates, um, phenology, and some other things, which really nicely maps also the distribution of semi-desert grasslands. So um, today we're focused in this 50,000 hectare area at Buenos Aires. It has a recent history of frequent fire, which I'll show some data on in a minute. And this other location down here, um, south of the border near Benjamin Hill, Mexico in the Sonoran Desert is another location that we've done some studies on. I have some similar data vegetation plots down there and that's um, within a, more of a rotational grazing system. So there's some real interesting differences there but I'll, I'll mainly stick to the um, Buenos Aires case for today. Um, Getting a little bit ahead of my study questions or things that we were after with this particular work, um, I wanted to show something about um, Buenos Aires in terms of fire. Um, these are plots from a design study. Um, we had fire history data from burn perimeters over a 30 year period, and that's where these plots were located within some strata. And then we've located since um, at least 24, 2012, um, vegetation and soil plots within um, some fire and uh, topographic strata. And then also um, in the absence of quail in the field, we developed um, from some, from some uh, phone applications actually from Texas A&M uh, a habitat assessment uh, set of plots that I'll talk about in a minute. But what I want you to see in this um, histogram of our, our plots, there's 240 of these things. Um, but we have vegetation plots that were in areas of little or no fire all the way to um, as many as five or more fires um, that occurred or prescribed fires and wildfires um, that occurred between 1985 and 2015. So 30 years of fire um, and some locations with um, a lot of burning versus very little burning at all. So that's some, some of the contrasting and sort of unique air, uh, unique attributes of this, of this refuge, it's an intensive burning program. So conditions for mass Bob White, this is um, from a report um, from Roy Tomlinson in the 1970s. And there's some really great photos. This is actually 
uh, photo from the 1960s in the Mexico side of the border that shows, I think, pretty nicely what we would have considered in the 1800s or pre pre uh, European settlement history in in the United States of what would be considered mass bobway habitat. Um, groups of low shrubs that provide uh, thermal cover, um, escape from predators. If they're leguminous, that's a source of winter food. Um, these are interspersed uh, among the grasslands that provide um, really the source of summer food and cover, um, which are mainly arthropods. And then I, I highlighted or pointed to here um, the patchiness of shrubs. You need some shrub cover uh, relatively close for escape areas from predators, shade um, during the intensive um, Sonoran Desert heat, um, and some, uh, as well as during the winter, some uh, cover for um, the cooler period. And then, of course, bare ground. Quail spend a lot of time um, on the ground, moving between ha habitat patches. Um, so bare ground between the grasslands and the shrubs is pretty important. Um, just to give you a little idea of maybe why these birds disappeared from Arizona and later um, from Mexico. This is 1960s photograph um, from, from some former quail habitat in, um, in Mexico in the Sonoran Desert. And quite readily, you can see the effects of grazing. This also was a major factor in the disruption of fire regimes. Um, that goes on today, that still continues. And there's pretty ample evidence that a lot of places in Southern Arizona uh, looked like this after intensive grazing in Southern Arizona, as well as some pretty strong drought events that happened at the, really at the, at the turn of the century, or right at the end of the 1919, 19, or the 1880s. Um, just moving up to today, uh, this is, these are a few photos of our plots. You can see some tapes in the background here. I'm um, just giving you an idea of the gradient of conditions that now uh, appear on the refuge from very low. This is a, a site that's highly invaded by Laban glove grass. There are some shrubs, sub shrubs, that's uh, sna some snake weed out there. And then along this gradient of habitat suitability, um, you can see that from our plots, there are some woke areas that would be considered um, medium. This actually came out medium in our, our rating system. Um, but some differences from those historical um, photographs. Mesquite is uh, highly dominant. It's probably an important species for quail habitat today, but you can see lifted crowns, little less um, branching close to the ground that quail need, but this um, gradient of conditions are what we were sampling. So what Brown and some others notice is that noticed um, in this paper from 2012 that a lot of the former habitat areas uh, for quail have shown signs of recovery. So really what our work was aimed at, really where, where is good habitat for quail, for mass bob white quail, for release areas and habitat improvement activities. And then also what conditions um, are really promoting um, improved habitat conditions. And of course that, that includes fire on the refuge. A pretty confusing or complicated um, flow chart here, but really what all this is, this is a paper we just recently had accepted in remote sensing of environment on multi-sensor models to map habitat that was a strong component using our field habitat assessment plots together with LIDAR and high resolution multi-date, multi-spectral data to map habitat, and then develop some structural equation or regression-based models to try and understand how mainly fire, but in conjunction with other biophysical factors, how does that, um, uh, promote uh, habitat development in this uh, semi-desert uh, context. Um, I'm just gonna finish up with some slides of results here. And what you'll see, this is these from our mapping exercise and then also some of the data layers that we developed to um, answer some of our study questions about habitat. This is a habitat suitability 
map or modeled habitat suitability um, overlaid with um, burned units or what these were formerly called, now they're called habitat improvement units. Um, those are these um, little polygons. And then this larger polygon is the um, mass bob white um, uh, management zone on the refuge. And these are our fire frequency, our fire history layers, um, red or color show a greater fire f frequency, um, as are these uh, warmer colors showing um, uh, fewer number of years since the time of, of last burn. So that's sort of the fire data that we're bringing to this um, uh, comparison. Oops, I, long, I missed, uh, oh, hmm. Well, let me go back. There are some boxes that were supposed to show up. There they are. Um, what I wanted to point out from this, um, these data layers is what you'll notice, these reddish areas of higher habitat suitability as compared um, to these uh, bluer, cooler areas are kind of in the margin uh, of the refuge in locations that had uh, little or no fire activity. So no fire frequency in these gray, uh, gray areas. And these were mainly unburned areas where we have our higher habitat suitability and then these areas that have burned uh, quite frequently, lower habitat suitability. Um, I'll, sh I'll follow up with some data on that. But another factor that's quite important to us here is that um, we have lost some of, these, some of these important areas for quail. This is a release area. It burned in 2018. And so some of these areas that have no fire still maintain high fuel hazard, which is a risk. Um, to habitat for the for the mass bob white. So looking at uh, univariate comparisons, what you'll see um, from our data, and this is at the management unit level scale, I'll show another scale of analysis in a second, and what you'll notice is habitat suitability is fairly negatively impacted um, by, by frequent fires, so, our, so more fires um, lower habitat suitability and greater time since the last fire. What you'll see out here at the end of our uh, Y axis, greater number of years, or really these, these were areas that had no fire, um, show greater habitat suitability. So what that's really pointing out is these are later successional areas that have the shrub cover. And I, I'd like to point out also that this will be apparent in the next few slides, why this is important, but these are mainly uh, spring, summer prescribed and natural fires. So fires that have been um, applied during sort of the historical um, fire season. All right, so why this, this figure, a little bit complicated. This is a path diagram from a structural equation model. Um, looking at our plot scale measurements and multivariate comparisons. And what it shows is um, what's really important to habitat suitability, at least at the, the site scale, is um, a very heterogeneous cover, a mix of forbs, uh, woody plants and grasses. And woody um, plants, this is a combination of both trees and shrubs because we had hardly any shrubs on on our plots uh, across the refuge. Um, but woody cover was very essential to having, um, a, or a, essential to a positive relation, or had a positive, highly positive relationship um, with hab habitat suitability. So this is very significant um, partial correlation coefficient. And over on the right side, you'll notice a similar pattern, um, greater fire frequency, um, more highly negative, um, relationship with habitat suitability. And of course, the more productive sites, sandy loamy soils, um, greater precipitation were highly positively correlated with greater fire frequency. And I'll just kind of wrap up by saying um, that has sort of provoked a switch in how fire, fire management and prescribed fire is, is being approached on the refuge to um, more burn during more uh, cooler season burns and more moderate burning conditions. And here, just another um, set of box plots showing similar things. 
um, as, as you can see with greater fire frequency um, from our, our sampling, you can see a decline in woody species, greater time since burned, and then increase in woody species. So that's really um, what has driven this, um, driven our uh, suitability assessment of why um, sort of more frequent fire may have, uh, have that stronger negative effect on uh, habitat suitability for the mass bobwhite quail. So I'm going to end um, just with a few thoughts that I hope will um, uh, help our discussion as we, you know, have a conversation um, with different panel members and folks listening is that at least for gra uh, grassland um, species, really, I, I felt um, from our work assessing uh, species specific needs, both plants and animals, um, is really essential um, where, where we have some um, sort of species uh, objectives and improving um, habitat uh, for, for endangered species. Certainly monitoring treatment outcomes longer term. Uh, and longer term in a grasslands is, you know, we, with some uh, fairly short time horizons relative to say forest systems, you can get a pretty good um, grip or understanding of um, how fire might be um, impacting species that were, we, we were, are important to our management and then adapting accordingly. Um, I'm going to stop there. Thank you, Steve. Hopefully I've stopped sharing. Yeah, it looks like everything. I'm not sure good. I stayed in the 10 minutes. <laughs> It's all good. We'll pass it on. We'll um, we'll pass it on to Scott right now. I'd encourage everybody to keep putting questions in the chat. Uh, there's some great questions in there already, and we'll get to those during the discussion. So, uh, to you, to you, Scott. Alrighty. <clears throat> Thanks again for organizing this and for the opportunity to present some of the results from our work on. Um, using fire as a management tool in uh, Northern Chihuahuan desert grassland. So uh, we're working in the uh, Sevieta National Wildlife Refuge. So um, central New Mexico and the very Northern end of the Northern Chihuahuan desert. And um, so the project I'm gonna talk about, I, a number of collaborators, um, Mark Mays for a uh, geography department at UC Santa Barbara, Lauren Bauer and Tim Oler associated with UNM here in the Sevieta Long-Term Ecological Research Program. and then. Paul at Ford at the Rocky Mountain Research Station here in Albuquerque. Um, oops. So let's see if I can get a little pointer going too. So um, just a little bit of background. Um, <clears throat> I've been working in uh, mesic grasslands and tall grass prairie for uh, since the mid 80s, um, particularly in um, Kansa Prairie in northeastern Kansas. And the goal of that long-term research program is to understand the dynamics of and interactions between fire and grazing and climate variability and how that structures tall grass prairie ecosystems. And we've also applied some of that work to um, grasslands in similar situations in, in South Africa. So I come from a background in which fire is hugely important driver in these ecosystems. And just for an example, um, so this is a photograph of Kansas Prairie and a, a patch of grassland that had not been burned for many years. And then fire was reintroduced to that grassland. And this is what it looks like today. And this uh, right across this fire break is a grassland that was burned annually up until this time. And then fire was removed from that system. And you can see the shrub encroachment is fairly dramatic. So fire has a huge impact on these ecosystems. And I came um, to the Southwest biased by um, these kinds of studies and the role of fire in, in these mesic ecosystems. And so one of the things I had to learn quickly is that desert grasslands are really not the same thing as tall grass prairie. Um, we're talking about low above ground biomass. Um, these systems that we work in are dominated primarily by black grama, which is a really wimpy grass. Now, vegetation covers patchy, there's a lot of bare soil. So moisture is often low and very um, pulsy in nature associated with uh, rainfall events during um, during the summer growing season and the summer monsoon. Okay. But when I got here, despite 
that uh, sort of background about the Chihuahuan Desert System. When I got here in March of 2003, I learned that the Fish and Wildlife Service planned to conduct a management burn in the refuge in June of 2003, so a few months later. So I was totally jazzed because fire is it, right? We love fire. Fire in grasslands is great. Um, however, many of my colleagues who have been here for years were really not happy that the Fish and Wildlife Service wanted to conduct a fire, a management burn in the refuge anyway. Nevertheless, we took advantage of this um, opportunity to sort of make some um, measurements and think about what fire does to these ecosystems. The particular goals of this management burn were to increase grass production and reduce woody plant cover in this area. So we went out and set up some permanent plots and uh, marked a whole bunch of um, yuccas, creosote bush, and um, ephedra, Mormon tea, and followed them after the fire. And none of the shrubs died and the grasses hardly recovered at all. Anyway, we learned a lot from that. And um, that was sort of common knowledge and why most of my colleagues that were here were not excited about the fire like I was. Nevertheless, fire is real in these systems, okay? And fire does occur in these Chihuahua Desert grasslands. So over here, this is the boundary of the management burn that was conducted in 2003, this slide. Prior to that, in 2001 and in 1995, there were two lightning caused wildfires approximately in the same area. And the uh, 1995 fire burned a small area, the 2003 fire burned a larger area, and where that uh, 2003 fire uh, abutted the 95 fire, they stopped. So essentially, it would not burn into that previously burned area. It's giving us a, get of, a bit of an idea about fire frequency in these ecosystems at a minimum of eight to 10 years. And so uh, given that, uh, what we found, was that overall grass cover decline, forb cover increased, and bare ground didn't change that much following these fires. All right, so it, it's, it's true that the, the management burn didn't actually achieve what was, was planned, but in addition, the management burn was really designed to be a lesson. It was a regionally uh, driven burn, um, and it was used to actually train uh, fire managers on how to do and how to con uh, conduct uh, these burns, and there was a fire crew located in the Sevilla. And, 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 um, and so they wanted to continue to use fire as a tool in the SICA system, and they would plan these various management burns in June, because that was when they argued was the most common historical period of time when it was always hot and dry. And then whenever they would plan a management burn, some forest fire would happen somewhere in the region and the crew would be called away and they wouldn't be able to do their management burn and they because the crew is out fighting fires rather than causing fires. And so our goal was to actually try to help the refuge determine whether or not they could do um, burns at prescribed burns at other seasons and still accomplish their goals that would allow them to not be so constrained by this historical perception of burning in June. And so we established with the help of the fire crew, a, a replicated just fire seasonality experiment where we uh, set up um, 20 plots, um, four replicates of each treatment. One was burned in the fall, so November, December. One was burned in spring, March. One was burned in the traditional time in June, and then there were four unburned controls. We had four replicates of each one of those. And we uh, started the burn uh, treatments in 2000, fall of 07, and, and did the spring and summer ones in 08. And we repeated the experiment uh, 10 years later, where we burn in the fall of 16, and then um, the summer of, uh, in spring and summer of 17. So the, all the treatments have been burned twice. And mostly we measure plant species composition, estimate above ground biomass, and um, just to get an idea of um, this community responses, the vegetation responses to these treatments. So there's the layout, it's typical grid, randomly uh, um, assigned plots, et cetera. Um, it's possible to get fairly complete burns in spring, summer, or fall. And so the, you know, the burn effectiveness is, the burns are patchy, but they're still fairly effective regardless of the, the time of year in which people burn. And over the long term, um, we've been monitoring just the vegetation response. So these circles represent the two years that burns occurred. And so that's why there's no vegetation here. And then we can look at the response. The red curve is um, the controls and the, the purple here is the traditional summer burn. And these were the other cool season burns. And so what we learned actually after a couple of years is that 
you know, shortly after the fire, the summer burn is the one with the most uh, loss of grass cover relative to the other seasons. And that um, in general, there's not a lot of response um, by some of the woody species like snakeweed and yucca out there um, with regard to their impacts on these ecosystems. And so these are small quadrats that we are scattered through each of the replicates. Um, following the second sequence of burns, we were able to get Mark Mays involved. Mark is a drone guy. And so he showed up with his drone and, um, and gathered these images of the uh, plots in the fall of uh, 2018. And the resolution is about five centimeters. And so with that resolution, it's possible using um, some ratios to actually assess at least some shrub cover, bare ground and grass cover on a larger spatial scale, like plot scale. Right, and so it's possible to tease out some of the shrubs in the system, shrubs that include um, yucca and uh, and uh, gutteresia in particular. Right, so we could tease out from this um, from the drone data shrub cover, grass cover, and bare ground. And when we look then at the results from uh, those measurements from the whole plot level after the second burn, you see that bare ground is very high on any burn treatment. Like grass cover is lowest on the summer burns, the traditional burn history. Yucca cover is least affected compared to the other burn seasons. And snakeweed, we don't see much happening with it at all. And so from this, we simply recommended to the Fish and Wildlife Service that if they wanted to conduct additional uh, management burns in these grasslands and use fire as a tool, whether or not it really needs to be in place, but if it, there's, enough, there's no uh, reason not to do those burns, we again recommend maybe cool season burns and, and avoiding trying to burn during the, the uh, really hot dry season in the summer. All right. And so these are my uh, main collaborators here. Um, and uh, Tim's a grad student, Lauren's the project manager for the LTR program, Mark's a postdoc at, at UC Santa Barbara, and Paulette's a research scientist at the Rocky Mountain Research Station. And um, this was to be her show. Um, but unfo unfortunately, uh, Paulette um, passed away unexpectedly in August. And so we're going to continue this project and attribute to her. Thanks. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, appreciate that presentation. And as a, again, as a reminder, any questions, please feel free to add those to the chat. Um, we'll also give you an opportunity to unmute and say those aloud during the discussion. And with that, I'll pass it on to Jeff. And good afternoon. Um, thanks for the opportunity to present and share. Um, again, my name is Jeff Adams. I'm the current regional fire planner for the South Southwest region, but formerly I was the uh, prescribed fire specialist for several zones in the uh, South and Central of Texas. Um, do a lot of work on burning on, on implementation on, on refuges and private lands uh, through several different mechanisms within the Fish and Wildlife Service. So, um, well, employing fire and grasslands in the Southwest, you know, we find is a crucial component to the ecological health and resilience of the landscape. Whether that's fire being used as a restoration or maintenance tool, or as part of a system to defend against catastrophic fires, you know, there's still a growing need to inform the best management practices of how we employ that fire on the landscape. Uh, Stephen Scott demonstrated that you know, interpreting the science and conveying it to into action on the ground to meet management objectives is key to achieving our desired results and management objectives for land managers and, and landowners. Expanding and utilizing science and adaptive management processes will continue to establish the playbook for successful fire and land management in the future. Um, land managers can, can look at these best management practices in order to include fire into their land management toolbox and look at integrated approaches you know, with chemical and mechanical actions as well uh, to further their cause. You know, science and research will provide understanding and the, on the effects of each of these actions in, in relation to each other. And, you know, one of the examples I've learned burning in, in Texas is, 
is the difficulty of, of, of the processes of, and, and how they work together. You know, we can go in and burn in a grassland and, and top kill mesquite um, and not kill the plant. And then that provides difficulty to integrated approaches in the future. Um, namely, you know, top killing it when mesquite will cause multiple stem sprouting and that makes it more difficult for chemical applications when you, when you work on those integrated approaches. So as a, as a fire manager, I look at the, the science and, and, and how they inform uh, best management practices and these validated best ma management practices to design an implementation strategy. Um, the playing field is full of barriers that often limit and even prevent the implementation of fire. And you know, Scott discussed our crews you know, planning, uh, funding, and looking forward to a burn, but only be taken away by, by the wildfire need across the landscape. But these barriers can impede the success of treatments on several levels, and they may not allow the impl implement implementation to incur in the way that align with the management objectives. Um, at times, we're forced to maybe pull off a burn in, in the wrong time of year um, as funding may lapse, you know, not really setting it up at the, at the right time in the right plant phenology phase. Um, so it's important for land managers um, and agencies to, to look into where these barriers are at and, and look to mitigating that. You know, for, for land man, man, land management agencies, these barriers can continue to be, you know, the conflicting burn windows. Um, you know, if there's a high visibility fire somewhere on the landscape, and it's really hard for us to, to convince uh, or, or to really be a good steward and part of the community to employ fire and set some fires when there's, there's something else that's burning down homes. You know, there could be local festivals and on a weekend or um, several different barriers um, for the agencies. And then for private landowners across the states, um, there are also um, several legislative constraints. There's liability issues, funding issues, um, and, and training in general. In each of the states, Texas and Arizona and New Mexico all have a different way of, of, of viewing prescribed fire and who and how that can be employed on a landscape. So. Um, we really look to these best management practices that are informed by science um, to, to help leverage and build out our strategies. Um, you know, that we want to be able to, to work with um, every group to create advocacy in, in employing fire on the landscape. And these best management practices uh, are, give us the ability to leverage that and demonstrate the need and provide justification. You know, as we move forward and, and look at, you know, employing fire on the landscape, you know, we need to, we need to be able to come together in a common front behind these best management practices um, through prescribed fire councils, through prescribed fire associations, um, to continue that advocacy um, in our legislature. Um, I recently was the uh, prescribed fire uh, chair of the Texas Prescribed Fire Council. And one of our largest um, um, workloads this last year was informing the legislature uh, on different practices and, and what, where some of these barriers are um, and then where some of the successes are. So it really works towards um, completing the, the overall picture. Um, you know, the best management practice also help inform the funding and planning cycles. You know, as an agency representative, we're looking at a scope of work for the next three or four years and knowing um, what time of season, what kind of fire we need to employ on the landscape really uh, can be, a, can really affect that funding and planning cycle. Um, you know, when it comes to staffing and, and, and other workloads. You know, with the new infrastructure bill that passed last week, there will be a large influx of money coming into the uh, fire agencies. And all of a sudden, we're finding ourselves, you know, strapped for um, ideas on, we're, we're not short of ideas, but strapped for, um, on timelines for where we look to, to spend these resources out um, and how to get that on the landscape. So having 
that planning cycle and knowing the best, where the availability, you know, best science is, is showing us where we need to get fire on the land, landscape can drive our workforce development. Um, and now this kind of boom time that's coming in prescribed fire. So moving forward, it's, it's all about processes and integration in my mind. Um, you know, it's really important for us to, to communicate the needs of land managers and then in turn, you know, seek, seek out and, and fund and, and work with and collaborate with researchers and science to help, uh, help drive that, that best management practice. And then, you know, that really just brings the circle back to the practitioners and really informs the practitioners of, of where they need to identify and put their workforce. So, you know, I, I think moving forward, I think it's, it's going to be key that we just keep the dialogue up and the uh, programs like this with the CCAST are, are crucial into showing the science and demonstrating it and, and wrapping it all into a nice package. Um, that way, land managers and practitioners can, can stay on target for their goals and objectives. So um, I know uh, we're running short on time for question and answer, so I'll, I'll kind of end it there. Thanks, Jeff. Um, appreciate that. And yeah, as Jeff said, this is the this is a great time for Q and A. There's a few that a few questions that came in through the chat, but um, yeah, I'll I'll leave this open. If anybody has any questions they wanna they wanna ask now, feel free to turn on your video, unmute, and and direct any questions you want to the panel. I'll leave a little bit of time here for for somebody who is in attendance to ask a question before we jump into some of those other ones that came into the chat. Can I just say, you know, following up on Jeff's presentation that um, we, we really had amazing help from the fire crew uh, to, um, to develop. I mean, it's a simple project, it seems like, but at, at the same time, the group was interested in actually doing something in an experimental context. And it did actually challenge some of their abilities, right? To, to do these fires in this scale and, and to get the things done. But it required them to go through quite a lot of planning, right? All the paperwork had to be done. And it's just, it's amazing um, how much effort went into that and just how much we appreciate getting to work with, with um, you know, the, the fire crews and the fire managers like that. It was, it was a very positive experience. Thanks, Scott, I appreciate that comment. Yeah, the collaboration with people who have that expertise, really key, really key. Um, yeah, Kathy, you had, a, you had a question in the chat that you just popped in. Do you wanna, do you wanna ask that question to the panel? Sure, um, I know, um, Having worked at Sevietta for so long, um, we that the the project that Scott reported on did not include Sacatone grasslands, but I was wondering, and I think Buenos Aires has Sacatone bottoms as well. Um, what you guys know about burning those? Because the BLM is always wanting to burn Sacatone grasslands, and I'm not sure if that's a good thing to do. Well, a little, a little stray from what we've been presenting on, but just wondering what you know. I, I do know uh, the, the Sacatone grasslands on Buenos Aires pretty well. And what many of those areas, there are a few really um, areas that are in better condition, but a number of those Sacatone bottoms um, down the middle of the refuge have been invaded with um, uh, Johnson grass and in other areas. And I think, you know, they've tried when I first got out there, they did try some burning and Johnson grass pretty respond, responds pretty well to that. I, I think there is a lot of room for um, improving those, those Sacatone grasslands that are there. Um, and I think part of that would be um, fixing the hydrology, not in a way where you're promoting Johnson grass, but maybe um, areas that are in decent shape maybe slowing down the, the flash flood pattern in a way that allows 
um, some moisture to stay behind. One of the issues there on the refuge is from heavy grazing outside the refuge and years of down cutting and things, um, that moisture uh, flushes out of the system really fast, um, too fast for those sacatone washes to really benefit from that pulse of moisture sometimes. So I think really in those cases, um, some uh, improvement of hydrologic function um, with some, I'm not sure simple structures will do it because of the um, stream flow volume during those flash floods, but there's certainly some places I think, um, I don't know about fire um, being the, the first step, um, but fixing the hydrology um, that once maintained those sacatone washes, that would be my first you know, effort there and, um, you know, some civil engineering, perhaps. Thanks, Steve. Does anybody else have any perspective about, I, I feel like a number of the presenters talked about the, you know, the species specific effects of fire. Um, and I think that that's a really important lesson to share that they're different in different places. Um, whether you're promoting, promoting layman's love, that might not be the right outcome. I, I, I yeah. wanted to say also in regards to the species specific areas, there are you know, other locations that we're working on other species. And I would say whooping crane in the uh, Texas coastal plain where you know, the pattern that I showed of perhaps negative effects mainly because of the, the woody cover that's reversed um, for other species where um, fire, more frequent fire, we would expect um, improved habitat conditions. And as um, time goes on, the return interval of fire, uh, returning fire to those systems really is important for maintaining the kind of sort of mixed marsh grassland that whooping crane like in those places where we're managing for those species. So, you know, that it's really dependent on what the objectives are um, yeah. from, from a wildlife perspective. That's a good point, Steve. Kathy, you have your, your hand raised and then uh, I'm gonna go to Valerie it has a great question in the chat. So go for it, Kathy. Thanks, I was just wanting to know too, what you guys think, um, it seems to me from looking at our burns, either wildfires or prescribed burns in our grasslands, at least in New Mexico here, where we don't have the invasive grasses that unfortunately, you know, Buenos Aires and Southeast Arizona has, but we have tumbleweeds and they just seem to be getting worse and worse. And what do we know about, you know, how, how, do, we, how do we take tumbleweed into account for our grasslands here in New Mexico? So, so I've noticed the same thing, Kathy. The last burn that you guys conducted was it September of 2019. So that part of the refuge is visibly completely infested with tumbleweed. And I was blaming it on the fire, except that when you walk around in the areas where it hasn't burned recently, they're also infested with tumbleweed. It just looks more visible because you've knocked out the grass from the fire. But I think there's a huge problem with tumbleweed now and once you get a large population this is one of the things we're talking about is like what happens next because historically invasive species in the uplands have not been a big deal plant species um, but now we're starting to wonder if tumbleweed is going to become a problem and we're we know that it will do super well on areas where there's high soil nitrogen so you get big patches of it growing in our fertilization experiments and we're thinking about trying to do some removal experiments like hand plot, hand weeding plots to get the tumbleweed out of them to see how that might impact the, the native species, grasses and forbs and things like that. But right now, it's also just a pain in the neck to walk through. I would, it, it's not exactly related to New Mexico, but you know, in some of our grasslands in Texas where we're having invasive grasses as a problem, that do at times um, seem to be promoted by fire, um, King Ranch Blue Stem um, specifically. And what we're finding is, is the best advantage is, is to find the right um, time of year to promote the native species because they, 
and in the end all, they can outcompete the invasive species at, at some level, it seems. Um, and so there's a paper being created right now showing that, you know, particular times of year burn that promote, it's not that it's damaging KR or setting it back extensively, it's that it's promoting the native species that'll end up out competing that invasive species. That's a really good comment, Jeff. I'm wondering um, with the, the seasonality of fire experiment that, that you did, Scott, whether you saw, will you have any insight about that in, in, in New Mexico or whether there wasn't uh, that kind of data that was taken in that project? Sorry, I was responding to Kathy's chat. What, can you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Too many, too many channels at the same time. Yeah. Well, Jeff made the comment of um, finding the right season to promote native species uh, in terms of this challenge of fire frequency benefiting invasive species. And I was wondering whether in the experiment that you did with the different seasonalities of fires, you found a certain season promoted those native grasses more than others and whether that might be a, a viable approach in New Mexico in the same way as Jeff was describing that being a viable approach in, in some parts of Texas. Right, so, so in, in our system, uh, the refuge has a large area dominated by blue grama, which is an extremely hardy grass and burning in blue grama doesn't really result in a decline in blue grama production. And so there are seasonality advantages that you could use for promoting blue grama, which is in a very, very important forage grass. Black grama, on the other hand, is better off not burning. Right, so that would be the season I would pick none um, to promote um, to mo promote black grammar. Thanks, I appreciate that. Um, I think we'd have time for for maybe one other question before we close out. We're coming up to the to two o'clock here in in Tucson. Um, so I, I guess I'd open it up as well. If anybody has another question, just a little a little free for all here. There was also, I realized, the great comment from um, from Valerie uh, in the chat about finding the the tools for predicting that fire window in in a different and and seeing that fire window sort of shrinking. So in the same way as Jeff was articulating the need for for planning, um, what are some of the tools that are available, or if anybody's working on a tool to predict that fire window? If anybody wants to, to comment on that or share something that they've used that's been especially successful for predicting that seasonality or if there's something that's in the works. Love to hear about that. Well, it's certainly, I mean, if you can, if you can sample fires that occur in different seasons, if you can't actually impose experiments at reasonable scales, I mean, drone imagery now is super important because you can get such high resolution measurements of what's going on in that landscape. And it's possible to be more specific than we were with regard to species composition. Um, either what species you wanna get rid of, like woody, woody vegetation in some cases, or promoting grass cover. But the challenge of taking advantage of um, natural wildfires or opportunistic burns is that they burn under certain conditions. And so it's hard to draw comparisons between a wildfire in May and a wildfire in August and things like that. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks, Scott. Does anybody else have any comments on that? Some great chatter uh, going on in the chat, these back and forths about, uh, yeah, Scott, about uh, tumbleweed and, and trying to use that um, to, to, to help remove creosote to no effect. And, and uh, Bill Radke having, having some comments about the seasonality of burns in, in Banwar. So we'll make sure to distill some of that and, and send that out to, to folks who both were here and, and could not attend or people who are watching this recording in the future on our CCAST YouTube channel. Make sure to add this 
um, back and forth in the chat to, to that as well. Any any closing comments from our from our panelists or anyone else before uh, before we call it? Well, I was I was noting some comments by Bill <clears throat> about uh, switching the to cooler season burns in Buenos Aires, and I think you know that's going forward it would be important for promoting more moderate fire behavior and um, shrubs and other species. Hopefully that has a, an effect that maybe changes the way uh, the response from vegetation communities there. It'd be interesting to see how that promotes conditions for quail and also restoration of native grassland composition. Thanks, Steve. Great. Well, thank you everybody for joining. As we close, I just wanted to um, give a few announcements from CCAST. Uh, this, we've, at the end of this month, it'll have been six months since the, the inception of the Grassland Community of Practice. So we'll be following up um, with that mile marker in time to sort of reassess and hear from you all what you're wanting to see as, as CCAST continues supporting the grassland community of practice. Um, other things that we're working on right now are related to decision support tools mentioned today about finding the right seasonality for burning and for remote sensing, things like that. We're trying to, uh, we're working in partnership with the rangelands Gateway and Rangelands Partnership folks to develop a searchable database of some of these decision support tools and link those to case studies of examples where they've been used. So if you have uh, some stories you want to share about using decision support tools successfully or unsuccessfully or are also working on produ producing a decision support tool, please do get in touch. Um, we'd love to hear about that. We're also working on an online management toolkit that will be that will be online uh, in the next months, uh, hopefully, and we'll let you all know. And we have some future panels lined up, but we would also love to hear from anybody who's present about what uh, what your pressing needs are, if there are specific speakers or topics that you want to hear about in the future. CCAST wants to know about it. So please do get in touch and, and let us know. Some of the future panels that we have are um, specific to management and restoration of grasslands for wildlife and about monitoring. So uh, any, anything beyond that, we'd love to hear about it. Thank you so much for joining us today and we'll see you, we'll see you soon. Bye everyone.